I am very pleased today to introduce to you Charles Du, a professor, full professor and a, a full-time professor at uh, Williams College. He teaches history. Uh, his specialty has been um, uh, slave sales and uh, the slave trade uh, and the Civil War. We had his book on sale and I just wanted to hold it up for you. It's called The Making of a Racist. And one anecdote I will steal from him is he told me that um, a black friend of his said, don't call it the making and unmaking of a racist. Just say the making of a racist. You'll sell more books. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this book, uh, and just, um, it was one of those books where I read it and I thought, I have to get as many people to read this book as I possibly can because it seemed to have insights in it that I had never seen before and uh, I couldn't imagine where the book was going even as I read it so it's a it's a very quick read and then you go back to it see how many uh, pieces of paper I put in my book it's because you have these things you want to get back to so you can read it to a friend or you have something that you think well I'll lose it if I don't mark it so and I didn't want to put marks all in my book so here you have all of a sudden, this sheaf of papers inside the book. It's a wonderful book, um, and it was, uh, I was inspired to read it, particularly because uh, I was terribly shocked by the um, uh, march in Charlottesville. Uh, I uh, am a native of Atlanta, Georgia, and when I saw the Confederate flag and the Nazi flag flying together, I thought, I have got to understand what's in the minds of those people. So of course, when I saw a book called the Making of a Racist, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, wait till I sat down and read it. I think you'll find that Charles Du uh, is a man of great insight and uh, exquisite manners, and uh, he is definitely someone that I am glad I have met, and I hope you'll feel the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Robert. It's, it's wonderful to be here on Columbus Day. Uh, I'm flattered, honored that so many people turned out. Uh, I wanted everyone to have a copy of the handout that I uh, passed around and, and Margaret passed around at the beginning. Um, in an odd way, what you're holding in your hands was the genesis of my writing this book. And if you've read the book, and I know some of you have because you've been taking a class that Margaret's teaching and I know she's got me paired up with uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I think is a fascinating uh, uh, juncture uh, to make in, in the, between the 19th and the 20th century. But this, this document really is something that, that is very, very critical for my putting this story together. Um, let me tell you what, what happened. I was uh, in my office at Williams and the rare book librarian called me and he said, we've just gotten uh, something here in the Chapin Library collection that I think you would like to see. And uh, so I said, sure. Uh, I was office hours, nobody was there. So I said, I'll come right over. When I picked this up and held it in my hands, I felt like somebody had slugged me in the stomach. This, this is the essence of the Old South's slave system. This, this is slavery reduced to its, its, its foundational uh, stone, human beings as property, chattel in the eyes of the law, uh, to be bought and sold like livestock. And I want to go over this document with you a little bit, not, not to get too wonky and, and play the, the history professor too much, but let me just get you to think about this and, and, and what it represents, and that may help you understand why it had such profound impact on me. Uh, it's from a Richmond auctioneer, Betts and Gregory. You see that shield in the uh, upper left-hand corner. Um, when I was a graduate student and doing my doctoral dissertation, I was doing my research at the Virginia State Library, I used to walk by this location uh, on a daily basis. Betts and Gregory auctioneers, and you see it's dated. And it's a printed form, which tells you something. They had a stack of these things in Betts and Gregory auctioneers. They filled them out on a daily basis. They, they, were, they were like a prices current. And the prices fluctuated daily, like, like any market, like any 
uh, market of any commodity. Prices rose, prices fell. So it says, we beg leave to give you the state of our Negro market and quote them as follows. And then you get categories. Extra men, number one dough. Dough means ditto in the 19th century. Second rate or ordinary dough. Then extra girls, number one, second rate. And then children sold by height beginning at four feet high and working up by three inch increments to five feet high, girls of same height of boys about the same prices. If you've read my book, you know this, this document is reproduced in the book. It's not quite as clear as what you're holding in your hand. That, that idea that you could buy and sell children four feet tall, any of you have any grandchildren, little ones uh, you run into every now and then that are four feet tall? What are we talking about here? Seven, eight years old, somewhere in that, that category. Um, I actually went to the, to the shipping manifest for Richmond. Shave, uh, slaves were frequently sent by ship to New Orleans. And the manifest gave a physical description of every slave who was put on board one of those ships. And there were four foot high children. And they were seven and eight years old. And they are being sold here without their parents. This is the way this market worked. Uh, marriages had no legal standing under slavery. Families had no protection <clears throat> under slavery. Everything devolved on the master and what he chose to do. What would it take to make an extra man? That would be a young man, 19, 20, 21 years of age, good musculature, no signs of the whip, no marks of the whip left on his back. Uh, he would not bear scars of something like smallpox to, to indicate that he had been stricken by disease at some point. He would be headed for the cotton fields of the Deep South, and he would probably be one of the lead plowmen in a gang. Uh, slavery was organized very, very efficiently. Your best workers were put on point. Every hand on the place was graded, full hand, three-quarter, half, quarter. And the, and the slave gangs that worked through the fields were organized to maximize labor. You put your point man on the, on, on the front to set the pace. Everybody else has to keep up. A mounted black driver or a white overseer was generally aside that gang carrying a whip. And, and the wealth that they produced in the cotton fields of the Deep South was incredible. Cotton was to the 19th century what oil has been to the 20th. Everybody wanted it, everybody needed it, everybody was willing to pay top dollar for it. And these prices reflect that. Those dollar figures may not mean too much to you. I'll tell you when I finish what that would translate into today. Look at the, 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 the clerk's report down at the bottom. This is a classic 19th century clerk's handwriting. Good young woman and first child, 1300 to 1450. Why is that in there? Special category, good young woman and first child. It was in every one of these reports. It was always there. Why was it there? Anybody know? Yes, ma'am. That's exactly right. She had already demonstrated her fertility. She had reached the, the point where she could bear, bear children and she had born a child. The child took the condition of the mother under slavery. So what this indicates is that this woman is not only going to be a worker for you, she was also going to add to your capital. Anybody want to try to read the handwriting? I read that first line to you. Anybody want to read what, what it says right under there? I'm hearing it. The market is what? Dull. This week. OK, why? Going to the fact that there are but few Southern buyers in the market. Excellent, excellent. The market is dull this week owing to the fact there are but few Southern buyers in the market. That's where the money was coming from. This is Richmond. These are the cotton fields of Georgia, North Florida, Alabama, Mississippi. That's where these men and women and children are being shipped. And then something has been scratched out. 
we're, we're going to get a little inside historical baseball here. Uh, this, this is what we do when we get a document. Anybody make out what's been scratched out there? That last one? We do not look for this to continue. Look for this to continue. This is, this is great. I've got some people who can read it and have a good voice. Uh, we do not look for this to continue. What's going on here? Look at the date. Look at the top line. It says August 2. Do you think it might have originally said August 1st? And the 2 and the ND have been written over the 1 and the ST? I think that's what's happened. The market has shifted overnight. It's changed, it's fluctuated that fast. It's gone from bull to bear. And that's how this market operated. You want to know how much those dollars represent today? The multiplier is 30. An $1860 can be multiplied by a factor of 30 to get it into today's purchasing power. So you're talking about those top categories being in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range. And that's what this market was, and that's what my antebellum white southern ancestors were engaged in. And that's how this thing hit me. How could they have been complicit in this? How could they have done what it took to make this work and to make it go and sustain it year after year after year? One of my ancestors was a, was a man named Thomas Roderick Dew. He was the president of the College of William and Mary. And the governor of Virginia asked him to write up the debate that occurred in the Virginia legislature in 1831-32 in the wake of Nat Turner's slave insurrection in Southampton County. And what, Robert, what, what, uh, what my ancestor, Thomas Roderick Dew, did in reviewing the debates, they, they reviewed the, the whole institution and decided not only to hang on to slavery, but to make it more severe. Uh, the, the, the freedom of movement, religious freedom, th things that slaves had come to enjoy were stripped away from them by law. And my ancestor wrote a write-up of that legislative debate that became the foundational document for the intellectual defense of slavery in the, in the three decades leading up to the Civil War. The pro-slavery orthodoxy, which gripped the South, was one of my ancestors' work. He started. Others built on it. So that's who I came from. And when I looked at this, I said, how could they do it? And then I had one of those moments, one of those flashes of recognition that every now and then we get. I did exactly the same thing. Not with slavery, but with racial segregation, with Jim Crow with cradle-to-grave discrimination based on the color of your skin. I was born and raised in the South. St. Petersburg, Florida may not seem like a southern country, but it was segregated to the core. And my mother and father, diehard southerners, wrought me up in that tradition, that southern tradition, that took the institution of racial segregation as a given, defended it, and told us, the children, that this is the way things were meant to be. So I had been just as complicit in the, in the abomination of my era, just as my ancestors had been complicit in the abomination of this era. And that hit me. And I decided I wanted to write about it. I wanted to write about those slave traders and their customers, and I wanted to write about myself. Because it seemed to me we were cut from the same cloth. And that's essentially why I wrote this odd book. It's a very strange book. First half of, half of it's about me. The second half is based on a reading of the slave trader's correspondence. I, I, I read every letter written by or to a slave trader I could get my hands on. Talk about a dismal research experience. Uh, it took all my training as a historian to stick with that one. But I wanted to get their mindset. I wanted to compare it to mindset. I wanted to see how both of us could done what we had did, we did do what we had done. And that's why this book exists. So I did, I wrote, I wrote the first three chapters about how I grew up, the last half on the, save, on the slave traders and their letters, and then I tried to bring them together uh, at the end in a conclusion. So that's what this book basically came from, it, it came from this document. 
And when I got the dust jacket, PDF dust jacket, uh, from my publisher arrived, and I clicked it open, rocked me back a little bit. There was the title, The Making of a Racist, and there was my baby picture <laughs> on the dust jacket. I was a really handsome kid. I don't know what happened <laughs> Some, so, somewhere along the line. Uh, I'm sitting in my mother's lap. And, and it did rock me, you can imagine. And, and then I thought, no, there could not have been a more appropriate dust jacket for my book than this particular image. Because my first, my first human experience, my first memories as, as a human being, were sitting in my mother's lap and having her read a children's book to me. And I brought that book with me today. And I'm going to read briefly from it. And I'm going to apologize in advance for the language. It's going to be, it's going to be objectionable to every person in this room. And it should be. This is the book. Uh, it's called Ezekiel. And it was written by a Florida woman named Elvira Gardner, published 1937, year I was born. And the first story, it's, it's about a, a little African-American boy living in uh, North Florida on the St. Johns River. And it's his adventures, and he has a lot of them. And, and he, he goes out into the world, and he, he plays, and he does things for his family, and he has interesting uh, characters and experiences. I love this book. This is how it starts. Away down in Sanford, Florida, there lives a little colored boy, and he names Ezekiel. And this boy, he lived with his pappy, and his, his mammy, and his sister, Emancipation, and his brother, little plural, and Asafetida, the baby. And one time, pappy didn't have no money to buy bread and butter and bacon and breeches and things. And so one morning, when Ezekiel was dressing himself, he said, Mammy, these here old breeches is so wore out, we won't hardly stay on. Mammy say, how are we going to get, you, get something to eat, much less breeches? Your pappy ain't got no job. Ezekiel say, I'll get us something to eat. And he get his little old fishing pole out of the shed and then rode up the road with emancipation, pulling the baby in a little cart, plural, toting the bait can. My first memories as a person were from this book. And my mother read this to me. And there were songs at the end of each of the little stories that we would sing. We would sing them in dialect. One of them is the wonderful spiritual Roll Jordan Roll. And my mother had a very elegant hand, has written in pencil, to hear Old Jordan Roll, O-L-E, to hear Old Jordan Roll, Roll Jordan Roll, Roll Jordan Roll, wants to go to heaven when I die, to hear Old Jordan Roll. She did it in dialect, O-L-E. My mother was an absolutely lovely person. She was compassionate, she was kind, she was deeply religious. Uh, she was one of those people who had a sort of aura about her that people immediately felt comfortable with. She thought nothing untoward about reading this to me. And one of the remarkable things, I think, about the power of that, that, that racist thinking and that racist culture was that it could take someone like my mother and get her to accept this, unquestioningly, accept this, and, and to read this book to me without a second thought. Because she loved this book. She thought it was, was wonderful, and I thought it was wonderful, and I love this book. My first thoughts were these that I just read to you. And, and my growing up was simply an extension of that. I, I use the word osmosis in the book. A lot of the Jim Crow culture I simply absorbed from, from watching people I loved, people who I came into contact with, my mother, my father, my brother, my, my aunts, my uncles, watching them as they interacted with, with people who were African American and how they handled themselves. There was an elaborate racial etiquette that governed the way we behaved. You don't think about etiquette in this, in this sense too much. It's, it's uh, Emily Post and it's how to behave properly. That etiquette governed almost every aspect of white-black contact in, in the South that I grew up in. You never shook hands with an African-American person. If they were an adult, you never used Mr. or Mrs. or Miss. 
you use their first name. Uh, if, if, if you engage them in conversation, there were a whole series of things that were off limits. You could talk about the weather, you could talk about automobiles, you could talk about football, you could talk about a variety of things that had no remote contact with race and justice. Anything that got into that area was totally off limits. Never came up. One of the things that, that I remember most vividly are the two bathrooms in our house. We had a nicely tiled bathroom for, for my mother, father, my brother and I on the top floor. We had a not so nicely appointed half bath off the back porch for Illinois Browning Culver, the woman who worked for us for years, African American woman, and a man named Ed who mowed the grass. They used the, the downstairs back porch bathroom. Uh, they had lunch at our house, but they ate off distinctive different china. I learned very early that the orange china in a cupboard off to the side of, of our kitchen was for Ed and Illinois. We were not to eat off that, and they did not eat off our plates. Illinois cooked dinner for us fairly often. She wasn't a, a cook, but her fried chicken topped anything my mother could do. So when, when my mother was tired and didn't want to work, she would say, Illinois, do you think you could fry some chicken before you leave today? And she would. Fix the dinner, couldn't eat off our plates. And as I grew up, almost everything I encountered reinforced this. Uh, I, I, I didn't get a, a, a countervailing narrative. Nothing came my way to suggest that there was anything wrong about this. I remember asking my mother. We called her Dear. Um, there's a story there. Um, my brother, older than I, before I was born, they were in her hometown of Huntington, West Virginia, and one of her, her relatives in Huntington, my mother's relatives, tried to teach my little toddler brother to say, to call, uh, call her uh, mother dear, mother dear. He couldn't get the mother part out, but he got the dear part out, so she became dear, and that's how she was known in the family, and that's, that's how I refer to her in the book. And, and as I say, she, she was a lovely woman. I remember asking her one day, I was still pretty small, why do Illinois and Ed live over on, on that side of town and we live on this side of town? She said, Charles, that's just the, the way things are organized and it's right and they're happy on their side of town and we're happy on ours. Everything is organized just the way it should be. And I never got any, any suggestion that there was something wrong with this, that this, this should be questioned. And I went away to independent school in Virginia uh, when I was 14, the high school was, was overcrowded in St. Petersburg. They were running two shifts into the high school, one from seven to noon, one from noon to five. And my father said, it's up to you, but I think you'd do better if you went away to school. Uh, I went to Woodbury Forest School. He had gone to the University of Virginia, both his undergraduate and law. Uh, so went to Woodbury, things were pretty much the same there. And my father, I think, had, had sort of come by his racism uh, in a different way than my mother. My mother was, was a lawyer's daughter from Huntington, West Virginia. She was, she was upper middle class. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side was an itinerant farmer and well digger from West Tennessee. And my father had been born in Lake Charles, Louisiana because his father was prospecting for oil there. There's a lot of it there, but he didn't have enough pipe to get deep enough into the ground to get it. His well drilling rig was for water. So I had this boyhood tale of lost wealth. He couldn't get, a money, he couldn't get anybody to loan him the money to dig, dig deeper. And, and that gusher of black gold was lost to my family because my, my, my grandfather simply uh, ran out of pipe. He went to St. Petersburg because of his health. He had tuberculosis and St. Petersburg was supposed to be a, a health haven. And that's where my brother and his, uh, my father, I'm sorry, my father and his two older brothers and their three sisters grew up. Um, my father was, was a teenager when his father died, leaving a widow and six children. And all of the boys went to work. Uh, my father sold newspapers, uh, sharpened straight blade razors on a strap in the local uh, uh, hardware store. And he, he wore his racism on his sleeve. There was no hiding it. Uh, he used language referring to people of color that my mother did not allow my brother and I to use. And my grandmother used the same language. And I think it reflects in part the, the, the way in which they grew up, the, the competition they felt. 
uh, perhaps economic as much as any. But my father's racism was out there. My mother's racism was genteel, but they were the same thing. They were both racist. And that's how I grew up. Woodbury Forest School, I went there for three years, did nothing to change my, my, my attitudes. I learned a lot of jokes at Woodbury. Almost every one was a dialect joke with black people as the butt of the humor. And when it came time for, for me to think about college, I was, like my brother before me, thinking, well, it's probably going to be UVA. We had been at this boys' school in, in rural Virginia for three years, le leading this monastic life. Uh, my brother wanted to go to UVA and major in fraternity life. <laughs> he made no bones about it. <laughs> my father, interestingly enough, said, no, I want you to go to Williams College. How in the hell did that happen, you might ask? My father's law practice took him occasionally to New York City. Uh, he had a client who wanted to build a toll bridge across Tampa Bay, a man named Al Gandhi. Gandhi Bridge was originally built. My father went to, to New York City to raise the money. So he talked to investment bankers, he talked to bond attorneys, he talked to anybody in, in, in Wall Street that he could find who might help out. And my brother and I were in high school, junior high school at that time, and, and he wanted us to get a first-rate liberal arts education because that's what had made the big difference in his life. He was the first member of his family to go to college, and his two older brothers sent him to college. They paid for his tuition, both for undergraduate and for law school. So he believed in education, believed deeply in education, and particularly in the liberal arts, which is what he had had at UVA. So he'd ask these lawyers in New York, now where did you go to school? And he had a way to measure an educated person, and it was how they used the language if they spoke well and wrote well, he thought they had probably been well educated. And a disproportionate number of the men who said Williams spoke well and wrote well. So he made a note. He had never heard of the place. He had heard of William and Mary, but he had never heard of Williams College. When he got home, he had a friend who had gone to Bowdoin, and he said, what's this place, Williams? Well, the Bowdoin guy told him. And he decided that was the place he wanted my brother to go, first-rate liberal arts men's college had a great reputation as a teaching college. And my brother's dreams of UVA fraternity life went up in smoke because my father said, I won't give you a plug nickel to go to anywhere but Williams. Try it for a year. If you don't like it, you can transfer to UVA. He had a sec I've, I've never told this before in a crowd, I'll tell you. He had a second prejudice he had developed by asking people where they had gone to, uh, to school. He told my brother he wouldn't give him a plug nickel to go to Princeton. Why? He said he didn't run, to, run into anybody in New York City who had ever managed to get over the fact that they had gone to Princeton. <laughs> Whether that's fair or not, I will leave up to you uh, to decide. My brother went to Williams, and, and basically he loved it. He talked up his courses, he talked up his professors. I, I, was, I just toddled along after him to Williams. And here I was, a Jim Crow kid, born and raised in the culture of the segregated South, plunked down on a college campus in the wilds of western Massachusetts. Strange land. The strangest thing happened the first day on campus when I saw an African-American classmate come into my dormitory entry, go in one of the rooms and unpack his bags. I was going to have a member of my class who was African-American. And it didn't register on me right away just how careful I was going to have to be in what I said in the context and when I said it. And I'm going to tell you a story which I didn't tell in public until three or four years ago. I was teaching a course with an African-American colleague of mine, a uh, winter study course at Williams, sort of casual, little, little off the beaten um, academic track. Uh, we, do, we do odd things, and we, we taught a course called the South and Black and White. We're at autobiographies back and forth across the color line. We had a wonderful group of students. We, we had this fabulous sort of rapport with, with each other, the teachers, the students. And I felt a comfort in that, in that room I'd never felt before. And I told this story. I'll tell it to you, and it's in the book. I was telling a dialect joke in one of the rooms in my freshman dorm. I had been on campus maybe two days. It was a Rastus and Lulabelle joke. 
and the Rastus uh, dialect I told in a deep baritone. The Lulabel voice I told in a high falsetto. And as I was telling this joke, my African-American classmate, Ted Wynn, walked down the steps of the dorm outside the classroom, and I stopped dead. And my mother had taught my brother and I, never humiliate anyone and never humiliate yourself. And I felt I had just done both. I didn't know if he had heard me, and I had to find out. And the next day I encountered him on the, on the freshman quad and I walked over to him and I stuck out my hand. It's the first time I had shaken hands across the color line and said, hi, I'm Charles Dew, I'm in your entry, uh, we're classmates. And he shook my hand, he said we were, he'd never let on that he heard me. And I breathed a huge sigh of relief. I never told a dialect joke again in my life and I was too embarrassed by that story to ever tell it in public until we taught this course, and I had not told my wife that story. I was that embarrassed about my actions in that context. But thinking back on it, that was perfectly normal behavior for me. I was, I was a son of the Jim Crow South, and that was part of the baggage that I carried with me to Williams College. Thank God my father sent me to Williams. Those four years were transformative for me, and it began with that friendship. My education at Williams began before I walked into the first classroom, and in some ways the most valuable part of that education. Ted Wynn and I became friends. I learned from my uh, history courses at, at Williams that the, the history I had learned growing up in the South wasn't worth the powder to blow it up. It was one of my father's favorite expressions. Uh, when I was 14 years old, one of my father's law partners gave me this little book. It's called Facts the Historians Leave Out, A Youth's Confederate Primer. And it was all about how the Yankees started the Civil War and they came down and beat up on us and stole our slaves and then they came into Reconstruction and that was worse than the war. This whole image of, of the, the, the South as, as being plundered by the Yanks and digging out from under it with our guts and our honor and our pride intact. That's what I learned. Well, you can imagine what I learned in my history classes at Williams. Not a patch on this. But yet I was still carrying this with me. I was carrying my father's politics with me. He considered FDR the Antichrist. That sound familiar to anybody here? FDR is the black beast, risen from the depths to, to, to lead the country down the road to perdition. I, I never heard him say FDR without an epithet, or generally a cuss word. Uh, son of a bitch, uh, connected to FDR. Uh, his father, uh, uh, his, his, uh, his law partner, I think, gave him this little book. He loved it. It's called Weep No More My Lady, and it's a diatribe against Eleanor Roosevelt for having the audacity to come to Chapel Hill, North Carolina to a conference and then write in her column, My Day, about how there were some lovely things about the South, but they would have to do some things differently to catch up with the rest of the country. And that produced this greed, this Jeremiah against FDR by a North Carolina radio broadcaster. My father loved this book. He kept it by his rocking chair and, and read it over and over again. Couldn't get over it. Uh, I got a copy of this too. My mother gave me this book, this is the book, it's called Aeneas Africanus. And it's the story of a freedman, a confused freedman after the Civil War, who's trying to get back to his old master and mistress and his old plantation with the silver that has been entrusted to him as Sherman's troops marched through Georgia in 1864. And because he's black and confused and he's a freedman and really can't cope, he thinks that his plantation named Tommyville is Thomasville. So he keeps trying to find Thomasville, and, and he wanders all over the South looking for it. There's a map, and he arrives, of course, with the silver just as the wedding party is taking place the night before the wedding. The silver has been there for every wedding that's ever, ever taken place, and a loving cup has to be drunk from by the bride and groom to guarantee that, that their progeny will be numerous and healthy. And here comes Aeneas Africanus with his African-American wife, his African-American children. And the story is, I, I, I can't read this to you, 
because the language in it and the way that, that it's presented is, is more, more objectionable than Ezekiel. Because it ends with Aeneas trying to return the Confederate money to his former master. And his former master says, no, I won't take it. And the man offers up his children in lieu of that because they are still, in his eye, belonging to Master Tommy, his own children. And, and the language he uses to describe this is appalling. So how did Williams change me? My courses. Coming home for Christmas my freshman year, I rode, rode the Seaboard Airline Railroad through the heart of the South. My father's law practice was in part as local counsel for the Seaboard. And so we rode his pass. So we always took the train. And I was coming home on the uh, train from college to Florida. I was in the dining car. We were somewhere in Virginia. And the, the people in the dining car were all finishing their dinner. They were all white. And I noticed as I was getting close to finished, a uh, uh, waiter, they were all African American, went into the middle of the car and drew a heavy, heavy green damask curtain across the center of the, the dining car. And at that moment, the African American passengers were allowed into the diner and they were seated on the other side of the curtain. And I remember thinking to myself, I've been riding the train for years. I never noticed that. Ted Wynn, my friend, couldn't be here. If he were coming to Florida, he couldn't be sitting at this table with me. And those insane Jim Crow customs that I had grown up with, the not shaking hands, all, all of that stuff, seems less and less the way things were meant to be. I wasn't out from under. It, it, it was an evolutionary process. It was a step back, a step forward, a step back, a step forward. But as I, as I, as I sort of got my, my, my education going, as I got my, my sort of social life on campus with African Americans going, I began to break away from that culture. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to talk to Illinois Culver, the African American woman who worked for us because she, she had been with us for decades, since, since my brother and I were tiny. She, she wasn't a nanny, she cleaned for us, uh, she did the, the, the wash, she did the laundry, she did the ironing, uh, she occasionally cooked for us, uh, but she was always there, and, and we, we knew that she was my mother's proxy. If, if, if deer weren't there and Illinois told us to cut something out, we, we did it. And I wanted to talk to her. And so I, I just got my driver's license, um, learned to drive in a 1948 Cadillac. Um, my father's older brother was a Cadillac dealer. We, we rode his, we got his demonstrators. Uh, no, 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 no uh, anything other than no, no uh, brakes, no power steering, no nothing. Just, just a big hunk of, of, of steel. And uh, I said, Illinois, I'd, I'd love to give you a lift home. And she had the nerve and the guts to say, okay, I'll let you drive me uh, in this, this machine. Um, and I wanted to get her to tell me about her life. The only thing I knew about her life was this. My father had a law, uh, had a client who had a lot of housing in the African American sections of St. Petersburg, and it was slum housing. And Illinois and her husband Joe lived in one of those houses. And I knew uh, from what she had told my mother that she was having trouble sleeping because the screens were letting in the mosquitoes and the roof leaked and, and, and the floors creaked and the steps were falling down. It was, it was slum housing. And the, the city of St. Petersburg was, was considering a housing ordinance that would make him and other slumlords clean this property up. And my father was representing this man before the city council downtown. And yet Illinois was living in one of these homes. What did he and my mother do? They loaned Illinois and her husband Joe enough money to buy their own home. This is classic patron-client relationships in the Jim Crow South. You look after the colored folks who are working for you. The big world out there beyond them, that's frozen in amber. That's never going to change. But these folks deserve something better than that. They work for us. We know who they are. And so I had been invited on one of those early trips to go into Illinois' house. She said, Charles, would you like to come in and, and see my home at your 
Mother and Father help me with? I said, sure, Illinois. And I walked in, it was nicely appointed, nothing, nothing fancy, but spotless, clean, petted her dog. Took a look around, this is a nice house, Illinois, I said. When I got home, I said, oh, by the way, dear, Illinois asked me to, to go in her house. And she made me sit down on the spot and describe everything I could possibly remember about what I had seen. As a white woman, she didn't feel comfortable walking through the front door of an African-American home. Perfectly okay for me as a teenager to do that. But she didn't feel that she could do that. And that was my only experience with Illinois other than as a domestic servant in our home. And I, I remember the day. I don't remember exactly how I broke the ice, but I think I did it by asking her about her son. They had one boy, his name was Roosevelt, and he had left St. Petersburg as soon as he possibly could. Gone to California, gotten a good job at a, uh, with an airline, I think. And I said, Illinois, you know, it's a shame that Roosevelt had to leave St. Petersburg because of something like race. And she looked over at me, and she didn't say anything. This was dangerous ground for her. I was breaking that etiquette. I was going into territory that she knew was fraught. And she looked at me and she paused and she said, yes, Charles, it is a shame that he had to leave St. Pete. And that broke the ice. I learned so much about her life. I know this sounds like a bad Hollywood movie, right? Or, or a pulp novel, uh, well-meaning white folks being educated by their, their uh, tolerant and, and uh, well-meaning domestic servants. Yeah, it's a cliche, but it happened. It happened for me, thank God. I learned so much about her. She could go into a department store downtown and buy a dress, but she couldn't try it on. And when she got it home, if it didn't fit, she couldn't take it back. She moved to the rear of the bus when she rode the bus back and forth. We had green benches in St. Petersburg. Anybody know anything about St. Petersburg? It's a retirement community. There are green benches lining Central Avenue, the main artery downtown. And I used to sit on those benches as a kid, waiting to go to a movie or, or go to the dime store after a movie, talking to my friends. African Americans were not allowed to sit on those benches. The cops would rouse them off the green benches if they sat down. I didn't know that. She told me that. She had a cleaning routine in the house. Uh, when she cleaned, she would try to get into our living room where we had a big old Dumont television set. Anybody remember the Dumonts? Uh, you could only have one television. They were so expensive. And we had a big Dumont in, in the living room. And she had asked my mother if she could turn on the television while she dusted and, and vacuumed the living room. And, and Dear said, sure, that's fine. And she timed it so that she got to the living room just as the, time, uh, the Price is Right came on. Anybody remember Bill Cullen, The Price is Right? And I said one day, Illinois, I noticed you get to the living room about the time uh, The Price is Right is on. You must like Bill Cullen in that show. She said, I do like Bill Cullen, Charles. It's the only show that has colored folks on as guests. I never knew that. I never knew any of this. And, and those conversations with Illinois were, were transformative for me. And they got me in trouble with my father. I didn't tell him about the conversations, but he knew my attitudes were changing. And I would come home and I would either keep a civil tongue or I would start challenging him. And the dam broke in my senior year. I was home for spring break and he took off on the Brown v. Board of Education decision, 1954 Supreme Court decision outlawing racially segregated schools, outlawing the principle of separate but equal. And as I said in the book, that was a bone my father never got tired of chewing on. He was an excellent lawyer, but that was anathema to him. He, Earl Warren, he, he cursed him and, and uh, anyway, he got off on the Brown decision and I had reached the, the point where I couldn't take it anymore. And he was going on, I interrupted him. I said, Pop, you're wrong. The Brown decision is perfectly constitutional. The Equal Protection of the Laws Clause of the 14th Amendment makes it so. I think I know more constitutional history than you do. He went silent. I left for college the next day. He didn't speak to me before I left. When I got back to school, my mother 
reach me on the long distance telephone. You remember those pay phones we used to have in, in the dorms in the fraternity houses? She reached me on the pay, pay phone, it wasn't easy. And she said, Charles, you've got to apologize to your father. And I literally sat down and thought, am I going to do this? I didn't give her an answer. And I, and I can remember weighing the pros and cons. I had come out from under that Jim Crow culture. I had just gotten admitted to grad school to work with Van Woodward, which was my, my um, sort of North Star that I was pointing toward. I had won a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. It was going to see me all the way through grad school. I was feeling my oats. And here my mother said, Charles, you have got to swallow whatever pride you, 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 you think you displayed on that occasion, and you've got to apologize. And as I weighed the pros and the cons, I decided I would do it. That I loved my father, that in many ways he was a good and decent man. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He had, a, had a, a whole lot of very elderly widows he took very good care of who had been part of the estates that he had he'd done. I had gone with him on these visits. I knew the kind of man he was in, in addition to that Jim Crow racist uh, belief system. So I called and I apologized. I don't remember what he said. I remember he accepted. It was a very brief conversation. But from that time on, we never talked about race again. We were Southerners. What did we talk about? Football, <laughs> uh, his law practice, business, uh, the weather, things in St. Petersburg that were changing. We had an armed truce. He never brought it up. I never brought it up. And in retrospect, I'm very glad I did. Um, I, I, as I say, I loved him deeply, and, and he wanted me with him in his hospital room the night he died. And if I had made that break at that point, it would have been irreversible. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Illinois, I think, loved my parents in, 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 in a very real sense. And she told me something on that, uh, that most memorable of trips that I'm going to end with today. We were, we were talking about Jim Crow customs, I think, these crazy things like her, her not being permitted to, to try on a dress or return a dress. And I was saying, Illinois, where do these things come from? And she looked over and, and she was very near tears. And she said, Charles, why do the grown-ups put so much hate in the children? Why do the grown-ups put so much hate in the children? She nailed it. Racism was passed on to me like a genetic trait. It was unquestioned. It was almost part of my physical being. And it took getting out of the South. It took getting to an integrated school. It took having professors who blew my insane version of, of Southern history right out of the water. I had a seminar my, my junior year, first semester, on the history of the Old South. Changed my life. I was going to law school. After that seminar, I wanted to study Southern history. So, so Williams did, did, did so much for me. And, and I think, in a way, my father got what he wanted. He got a good liberal arts education. I think I can write and speak reasonably well. But I didn't carry away with me the culture that I had been raised with. And I've sometimes wondered if he thought deeply about what he was doing when he sent my brother and I to Williams. I think I never asked him. Never had the, the temerity to ask him. But I think he considered that armor in which we were clad, that racist armor, I think he considered it impenetrable because it was his belief system, and he knew it was right. And we could go to Yankee New England, <coughs> liberal New England, and we could get a good education, and we could come back unmarked, unscarred as far as that dimension of our belief system was concerned. I think that's, that's the only thing that makes any sense to me. But it didn't work. Thank God, it didn't work. I've talked about my book in, in several venues. Um, I was asked to give the commencement address at Woodbury Forest School, which is located in Virginia, 400 boys between Orange and Culpeper. <laughs> Those aren't large towns. I gave them essentially the same talk, shorter that I've given to you. And the response was overwhelmingly positive. Um, I live in hope. Gets tough at times, particularly these times. I didn't know in 2016, the book came out in August of 2016. I know, did not know what was looming in November of 2016. 
I had no idea my book was be, would be as timely, a book, The Making of a Racist, would be as timely as this book has, has become. But I consider it an honor and a privilege to be asked to venues like this to talk about it because we've got to talk about it. We, we can't be polite about this stuff. We, we can't, for social niceties, hear somebody make a racist comment and just swallow it and, and go home. My wife and I learned that the hard way. Our older son is gay. He came out when he was at Yale in the mid-90s. And it was a different era then. And my wife and I were not talking about this in social settings, and we'd hear homophobic comments. And we wouldn't say anything, and we'd come home angry because we, 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 had, we had swallowed our anger. We had betrayed our son. We decided we weren't going to do that anymore. If we heard something, we were going to speak up, and we started doing it. Boy, did that have an impact. It, it made us persona non grata, I'm sure, in some circles, but we didn't come home angry and feel like we needed to take a shower. And I think, I think we owe it as a civic obligation now to do exactly the same thing, to, to challenge racism, to challenge all of the, 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 the stuff that, that's polluting our culture right now. I, I really think that we, we have all got to be a part of the solution. We can't just be passive about this. Uh, there's no guarantee that history is going to move inexorably forward in a progressive way. It really is going to take hard work, I think, to put the country back where it needs to be. I'm really grateful to you for being here. I think I'm probably preaching to the choir uh, today. I don't think there are probably too many people here who need to have me shake them by the collar and say, <laughs> you've got to give up those Jim Crow ideas. But, but really, I, I do think we're at a moment of, of real national emergency on, on our, our civic life and our civic culture. Um, I hope I'm wrong. We have an election in about a month. That'll be at least a, an indicator of where things stand. Um, there's so much that's been, been happening in the news lately, it's, it's, it's hard to keep up with the news cycle, isn't it? We have a newsman in the audience, I know. Have you ever seen anything like this, Bob? No, no, it's, it's unique. It's, it's unique. Um, yeah, I, I, I took the class after the election to just talk about what had happened. And, and I had immigrants in the class, I had children of immigrants in the class. I had African Americans in the class. And the distress was so palpable, I didn't think I could teach that day. I just let everybody talk. And um, I, I think that that was, that was a very powerful sort of message that, that I got in, in that moment. Um, I promised Margaret I would not speak more than an hour. I have not spoken for more than an hour. I checked my watch. Uh, I know she wants some time for questions, and I said I would keep it short as I could because that's generally the most interesting part of a presentation like this. Uh, that first hand is always a little tough to go up, um, but somebody's got her hand up. Thank you. Yes. How do you explain the, 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 the racism today? Uh, how do you explain they're getting uh, more people than their parents? How do you explain this expansion? I think, I think it's been there. I think it went somewhat underground during the two Obama terms. But I think having a black man in, a, in the White House for a lot of Caucasians was an abomination. And that began to surface during his presidency. I remember seeing Tea Party rallies with crude caricatures of Obama on placards being carried around. Uh, I remember the, the Southern Poverty Law Center was tracing the upsurge in the um, white supremacist groups that were organizing all over the country. I think it was always there. I heard a brilliant description from a, a sociologist at, at Berkeley who, who spent uh, years living in South Louisiana with people who lived in, in uh, Cancer Alley, the petrochemical uh, plants along the uh, Mississippi River. And they're all poor. Many of them have health problems. And they all are Tea Party Republicans. And she wanted to find out why. And she said, they think of themselves as being at the bottom of a hill, looking up, and the American dream is at the top of the hill. And it's a nice house, it's a boat, it's a car, it's a college education for their kids. And they're running as fast as they can in place, and they're getting nowhere. And they look up the hill, and who's breaking in line? 
Black folks are breaking in line, women are breaking in line, immigrants are breaking in line, refugees are breaking in line. And I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. I'm gonna vote for Donald Trump. And I thought that was a brilliant description of, of what, what the pollsters were telling us and what a lot of people were, were sort of scientifically trying to figure out. But I thought that image of, of being, being, being white, being, being poor, being abused, looked down upon, uh, that, that there were enough people in enough places who felt that way, men and women, to vote the way they voted. Long answer to your question. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, thinking back to the Civil War, I, I still, and I loved your book, thank you, but um, I'm still puzzled as to how all of the, let's say, very poor white farmers, et cetera, who had no real vested interest yeah. in uh, the slave economy, et cetera, were persuaded to go out and die for that. Everybody understand the question? Why did poor white yeoman farmers join the Confederate Army? Very good question. I've written a little book on the coming of the Civil War. In fact, they have copies back there. It's called Apostles of Disunion. It's an effort to explain the, the secession of the Deep South, the seven states that went up first. Um, slavery and race lies at the heart of secession. The states' rights thing is a fig leaf that Southerners used after the war to explain their, their actions. Why did yeoman farmers go to fight? Wars are caused by, by sort of macro causes. Men enlist for micro causes. A lot of it is defending hearth and home. A lot of it is not wanting to appear a coward when, you're, when you're, your fellow whites are, are enlisting in, uh, in April and May of 1861. A lot of it is because you have a white skin. If you were a white yeoman farmer in the South, no matter how poor you were, your skin elevated you among four million people who were black. It was a floor under which you could not sink. You didn't have to own a slave to believe in the slave system. And whites who didn't own slaves aspired to own slaves. Owning a slave was a mark of wealth, social standing, uh, the, the elevation of your class. It was like owning a luxury automobile or a McMansion. If you didn't own slaves, you aspired to own them. A friend of mine says, says this. He said, the South wasn't a culture with slavery, the old South. It was a slave culture. Slave was at the core of their politics, their economy, their social structure their intellectual life. So to be a poor white and not own slaves meant you were still a white southerner. And by God, you were gonna fend the South and you were gonna fend the racial order that was established there. Yeah, long answer again. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for coming, this is wonderful. Uh, Williams College was founded in 1793. What, what are its ties to slavery? Pardon me? What are its ties to slavery? Ephraim Williams, Colonel Ephraim Williams, who left his uh, estate to Williams College, owned three, sa three slaves. So, so he, was, he was a slave owner, and his assets went to found the college. I don't know the fate of those three individuals. Um, it was a family. Uh, but that's something that I want to find out. Um, I'm still teaching students and teaching honors theses, and the next thesis student who wants to ask me what I'd like him to do I'm going to tell him to, to investigate Ephraim Williams and his slave ownership. Places like Brown, Georgetown, have had to come to groups with a major. The, 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 the sale of slaves basically saved Georgetown University. Uh, Moses Brown, who helped found Brown, was a very large slave trader, international slave trader, Atlantic slave trader. So, uh, yeah, a friend of mine has written a book about this. It, it's, a, it's a story that, that higher education needs to face up to. Yes, sir. Last year here in Woodstock, the movie Gone with the Wind uh -huh. was banned effectively. And I started reading about it. It's probably one of the most famous movies. Mm -hmm. Won uh, so many Academy Awards. Yeah. There's no, when you read the book, the word racism is not used. Yeah. Do you think that book and that movie should be banned? That's a good question. Um, several movies, the, the NAACP tried to get Birth of a Nation banned in 1915. If you've seen Birth of a Nation, the D.W. Griffith film, you know how blatantly racist that is. 
Uh, they were unsuccessful in part because Woodrow Wilson had, had a screening in the White House. Came out and, and said it's history written, written with lightning. It's a shame it's so true. Um, the Disney uh, Corporation has taken Song of the South out of circulation because again, it's, it's the Uncle Remus tales and it's all done in dialect. The depiction of the, the slaves in uh, Gone with the Wind is uh, romanticized and uh, highly ahistorical. It is not a patch on what the slave system was. Uh, the, the caricature of, of someone like Mammy or Prissy who play critical roles in the movie. Th those are caricatures of the way Hollywood presented black people in the 1930s and 40s. The step and fetch it characters, for example. Um, oh, who? Charlie Chan's chauffeur, who was scared of ghosts. I mean, th this whole sort of black stereotype, the, the way Hollywood presented it. Uh, I think it should be shown and interpreted. I think it should be shown with, with someone up there explaining, you're going to see something that is going to educate you about the way these images were manipulated and how they were presented and how they seeped into our culture and accepted as much in the North as they were in the South. I think there's an educational potential there. And I think those need to be, you know, need to be grasped. I, I would have liked to have seen it shown and I would like to have seen the, the, the theater operator have the good sense to do this. Yeah, yes sir. Gone with the Wind was a band which uh, was, was removed at the time, it was supposed to be played, but it was removed at the time because of that incident in Missouri at the time, the shooting that we Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah but it was, it was a typical knee jerk reaction. Okay, okay. It's awesome. Yes, in the back. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I just want to say I, I um, very much appreciate you being here today, and I. I, I uh, I think for all of us, it's really important to have the historical context. But as was it Pogo used to say, we've seen the enemy and he is us. We, we, much of this is still here and it's in the north, it's in Woodstock. It's, and we have to look inside ourselves. Um, and one of the things that really struck me was, um, and no disrespect to your mother at all, or you know, anybody's mother for that matter, but, um, She's a wonderful woman, um, etiquette. Those are two words uh, or two ideas that we've just seen in the, uh, the discussions about our prospective new chief justice. And that's more related to sexism, but because it's so current, I think people might be able to see how this idea of he's a good man or um, the loud, mouth white racist those we don't know what a loud mouth we don't know those people and that's why it's so easy to say it's the other people and we really have to understand you know what we grew up with um, all the things that we might uh, it's very it can be very subtle especially in a place like Woodstock where we sure. we don't have a lot of um, African-Americans or people of, of um, uh, other so-called races. I mean, race is actually a concept. It's not a, there sure. is no such sure. thing. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I guess I'm really making more of a comment and Thank saying, um, and I know, I've been in rooms where I've heard people make jokes, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's you know racist or sexist, mm -hmm. and it's kind of light. It's mm -hmm. light racist. Yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's all too common, unfortunately. I think your comment is, is, is a very good one. Um, good people can harbor bad ideas. Good people can embrace uh, a bad culture. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that is in my book. Uh, I think my mother and father were, were good people for the most part. Um, I say at one point, I think they helped me to get over my racism by, by the, the, the better angels of their nature were there. And I think they helped me when push came to shove and I had to decide what was right for me. My father said, if I lose my integrity, I've lost everything. I can't practice law. And, and he and I defined integrity on these matters differently. But that principle was, was planted in me at a very young age. And I, I came to a different, different place. Yeah, it's hard in social circles to, to say what you are suggesting we need to say. Yes, ma'am. 
I understand the analogy of people who are at the bottom of the swamp seeing anyone that impedes their um, ascension as threatening. Mm -hmm. What about people, and I don't mean to put your family on the spot, but you've written about it in your book mm -hmm. so much, so forgive me. What about people like your What do people get out of being a racist? It was a way of life. It, it was considered the right and proper way of life. Uh, you dealt decently with the African-American people who you employed, but yet the system itself was sacrosanct. The Jim Crow system itself was sacrosanct. The, 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 the inner core is, is a sexual fear of black males and white females. Uh, there's no getting around this. Um, it, it was bred into the marrow of white male bones that white women were vulnerable and that black men were threatening. And at, at base, the, the segregation system was put in place to sustain that. Um, and schools were particularly important because that's when young, young white boys and young white girls and young black boys and, and young black girls were rubbing shoulders together. Um, how did this come about? I speculate about that in my book. You, 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 you can go back in the history of the South and you find this coming up over and over and over again. Thomas Jefferson, who, who's, who had children with his, his, his wife's half-sister, Sally Hemings's father was Martha Jefferson's uh, father. Jefferson wrote about race in, in his Notes on the State of Virginia, he published them privately in 1785. It was probably the most extensive commentary he made on race. He gave us the principles of the Declaration of Independence, Abraham Lincoln's North Star. We wouldn't have Lincoln and the Union if it hadn't been for Jefferson and the Declaration. In 1785, he said, with, with us in the South, if we free the slaves, they will have to be removed. They will have to be expatriated. Why? Because we will either have a race war to the death, because they will take out their grievances, their just grievances on us, or we will have a staining of the blood of the white race. 1785, Thomas Jefferson, doing what he did, keeping a woman as his wife, she bore him children, condemned the staining of the blood of the white race, while he was in effect doing exactly what he was issuing this Jeremiah against. And, and this has been with us. You can, you can look at politicians in the antebellum South, in the Reconstruction South, in the Jim Crow South, Theodore Bilbo, James K. Vardaman in Mississippi, the, uh, who, uh, Strom, Thurmond. Strom Thurmond, Richard Russell in Georgia, the, who mentored Lyndon Johnson, held the, held the battle uh, ramparts against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, it's, 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 it's bred into the marrow of our bones. And, and that's, that's as close as I can give you to an answer to that. It's fascinating, but where I was going was trying to, you know, pull that forward as to why there are things like women for Trump and women for Kavanaugh. Like, what is that for there? Well, we live in a, in a tribal politics, and, and people seem to be able to submerge almost anything on, on partisan political grounds. Uh, it's, it's something that is not new under the sun. We've had contentious politics. Uh, we haven't had quite this recently. If, if you look at the politics of, say, I don't know, the early national period, the Jacksonian era, certainly the politics of the 1850s, you see the same sort of, of uh, vitriol being, being sort of broadcast. Uh, it's nothing new. It, 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 it's not been as commonplace in our politics as it is right now recently, but it's, it's certainly there now. Yes, ma'am. What is the power of pure pressure to maintaining the racial divide? Good question. Yes. What, what, what's, the, what's the role of peer pressure in, in sustaining this racist culture? Yes, my uncle in South Carolina was a pediatrician, and he was the best pediatrician in the town, and he treated both white and black children. He had separate waiting rooms for them, but his, his clinic was, was in the middle where he practiced medicine. Yeah, he joined the White Citizens Council 
in Orangeburg, and he told me this. And I had the greatest respect for this man, and I couldn't believe it. I, I was stopping off in Orangeburg in my 55 Chevy when I was driving back to Williams, and I would stop there and spend the night. And I, I, I really loved my uncle and had a great deal of respect for him. And he said he had done it to protect his children, to protect them from being uh, essentially ostracized and, and maybe even physically threatened at uh, their school because it was known in the town who joined the Citizens Council and who didn't. Most of you know that was a sort of white collar clan that came in the wake of the uh, Brown decision. It was founded in Mississippi, spread all over the South. Uh, and it was a sort of rotary club <laughs> clan, uh, the, 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 the White Citizens Council. Was, was that drawing on that sort of cohort. Uh, yeah, it was very powerful and, and hard to break. And, and he felt that his children were at risk. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think another thing that piece of the history here in terms of your, what you're talking about in terms of this fear of young African Americans is that in the earlier in the 18th century, the slave trade was greatly diminished when some, some countries stopped. For example, Britain had a strong abolitionist tradition, stopped participating in the slave trade. And so the South was stuck with the fact that they had this huge economic machine around cotton that could, almost, could only be supported by slavery. And so in fact, what happened was there was great mixing. Uh, many slave owners had free sure. access to slave quarters. The more children they could produce, the better off they would be economically. And this led to this very peculiar code that we have in the U.S. about race, which is the one drop rule. Mm -hmm. So even though you were the child of a slave master, you were considered you yeah. know, black. And, the, and so in fact, this <clears throat> rather than the fear, the actual fear of young black men, there was, you know, had been already a great deal of mixing on the part of white men and slave women uh, prior Absolutely. to Absolutely. And so that's why this issue around race being a social construction, in fact, you know, we are a mixed racial uh, people to a large extent. Yeah, ab absolutely. The reason these prices are what they are is because the African slave trade was closed to this country. It was one of the compromises in the Constitution, you may remember. There, there were a couple of compromises on race. There was a fugitive slave clause added to the Constitution, though they didn't use the word slave in the Jumps of the, the jumps they had to go through to, to avoid that word are, are striking, if you read that. Uh, the interdiction of the slave trade was permitted by Congress, but only after a passage of 20 years. So 1787, it could be closed in 1807 if the president asked and Congress agreed, which happened. But in the interim, South Carolina did reopen the African trade. South Carolina imported, imported about 40,000 slaves from West Africa, 1803, 1804, 1805. And that was the Gullah population of coastal South Carolina. And, and one reason South Carolina was so radical when it came to secession was that they had a slightly different slave system than other places. They, they weren't Creole slaves, these, these Gullah slaves. They, they were not born in, in North America. So, so the history, the, uh, one, one of the things Brian Stevenson, the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, one of the things he says, history matters. And we've got to come to grips with it. We can't pretend like it doesn't exist. He built a lynching memorial in Montgomery. Anyone, anyone been there and seen that? I've, I, I was there to give a talk this summer. I went there. It is unbelievably wrenching to walk into that. And the museum that goes along with it, which begins with slavery and ends with Jim Crow and mass incarceration. This is Brian Stevenson, the man who, who founded the uh, Equal Justice Initiative, works with, with death row inmates who he thinks has been, who have been unjustly convicted. But, but uh, I, I've, I've found that incredibly powerful and, and hopeful to see that there. Honey? What is your position on the Confederate statues? Confederate statues, good question. Uh, most of them went up during the Jim Crow era. They were built in the 1890s, mainly early years of the 20th century. Uh, there was a Georgia marble company in Marietta that sent drummers out, salesmen out. Uh, and they would go into a, a courthouse town and they would meet with the United Daughters of the Confederates and they, they would say, um, East Frankfurt doesn't have a Confederate statue. It was like the Music Man. You remember Harold Hill? 
River City needs a brass band. That's what these uh, salesmen were doing. And the Marietta Marble Company sold the base. And the statues were basically made in, in Italy and shipped over here. And they were put up at a time when the Jim Crow laws were actually being written. The first Jim Crow law was 1881. That was a, a Tennessee law segregating railway uh, passengers. And then they just exploded after that. And, and disfranchisement came. Mississippi disfranchised blacks in 1890. South Carolina, 95. Uh, Louisiana, 1898. This is exactly when these statues are going up. And, and they were erected in part to honor the lost cause, to honor the Confederacy, and to send a message in this place and time that we haven't forgotten our Confederate ancestors who wanted to achieve independence and erect a slave-based republic. They, they admitted the slave-based. So they came, they came at a particular moment in time and, they, and there was a reason they were put up. Seems to me you can do one of three things with them. You can leave them where they be and do nothing, which I don't think should be done. You could interpret them at the site to make sure that anyone who sees them knows some of the surrounding context that I just described. Or you could take them down and put them in a museum context where they could be interpreted and offered there um, as a sort of example of this moment in Southern history when, when racism was being hammered into law. These, that's when these things were being, were being erected. So, bottom line, I think everybody in the community needs to weigh in. Th this is a community issue. And I think it needs to be discussed, and I think that, that people need to be informed, and I think they need to decide what to do. I know that Margaret's class is going to deal with this. She handed me a sheet showing all the Virginia Confederate statues, just the heads of the statues. They're all over the place. Uh, yes? If you feel comfortable saying something about it, I'd like to know uh, your brother's position today yeah. uh, regarding racism. Yes, uh, John and I came to the same place, but we took longer to get there. Um, he went to UVA Law School and joined a fraternity while he was there because his fraternity, Phi Delta Theta, had been kicked out of the national. He joined Phi Delta Theta because they had been my father's fraternity. Uh, his chapter at Williams was kicked out of the national because his pledge class had a Jewish student in it. And they kicked the national, the national kicked the uh, local chapter out. He joined my old fraternity, which was Delta Psi, St. Anthony Hall. I joined a fraternity at Williams. They don't exist there anymore, by the way. <laughs> we, we, we uh, in the 1960s, uh, got rid of fraternities. In the 70s, we went co-ed, so we've done some good things. Um, John got there, but it took him longer because he went to UVA for law school and went back to practice with my father. So he was sort of in the lion's den, as it were, uh, when it came to these things. I remember 1960, I had a Kennedy bumper sticker on my car, on my 55 Chevy, and, and uh, my brother came out and saw it and said, whispered to me, uh, I'm gonna vote for Kennedy, but don't tell Pop. <laughs> so so he, he, he got there, but he had to be uh, sotto voce. Uh, he, he's the last Democrat anybody in my family voted for, except for me. Is that right? Okay, okay, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about, and maybe you can answer this question, how you came to be in Lake Vermont at this particular time. Um, Margaret Edwards invited me. Um, she is teaching my book in a, in a class that she's teaching, and uh, she also, with Florence Short, who's in the back, her old friends, my wife is Rob Foreman Dew, the author, and um, they came to see her, as well as to talk about my book, and. Margaret said, would you like to come up to Woodstock? And I'm on fall break now at Williams. So I said, sure, we'll do it fall break. So she issued the invitation, has treated me like royalty and Rob like royalty since we've been here and we're having a fabulous time. Uh, so I feel, I feel honored to be here. Yeah, that, that's, that's the short answer. Mr. Hager? Presentation was terrific. Thank, Thank you. And, uh, to put it in personal terms like that is really powerful. Uh, this is a simple question. Where, where does the term Jim Crow, where does that come from? It was a minstrel dance. It was a blackface minstrel dance. It was called to, jan to dance Jim Crow. And somehow that word got transferred into the system that, that kept black people basically in, in separate but unequal positions. But the first use of it 
was in, in the minstrel context. I don't know the, the history of the transition. I don't know who was there to, to sort of make the move from, from that setting to that setting. That's where it came from. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. How did Illinois Noise get her name? She was uh, not born there. She was born in, in North Florida, town of Quincy, actually, Havana, which is right, right next to This is among the poorest parts of, of Florida. This is. This was cotton country now, it's shade grown tobacco now, and I went up there uh, to give a talk in, a, in the school desegregation period, and uh, I saw um, agricultural workers, African American, living in what were clearly former slave cabins, field workers, working, working in the shade grown tobacco industry. Uh, yeah, uh, it's cigar leaf, I think. Um, she never told me that, I, 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 I assume that uh, and, and it was a question I should have asked her, but didn't. Uh, I don't know where it came from. Um, that was it, yeah. Uh, somebody who hasn't gotten their oar in the water yet, I think we're, we're, we're five minutes away from our 4.30 terminus point, so I'll go to the rear. Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me, I'm an interloper from the UK. <laughs> I just wonder how you see the balance between the responsibility for ending racism between government and individuals. I think they're, they're basically one and the same, aren't they? Um, it, has to, it has to be at the, at the national level, it has to be at the sovereign level, and it has to be at the individual level. Uh, I think they're joined at the hip. Um, and if you have a democratic society, I don't see how you're going to get one without the other. Um, racism is, is pernicious everywhere it is. Just, just think of the power of stereotypes, racial stereotypes. The age of consent for females in South Carolina until 1895 was 10. Because white boys had to be protected from Jezebel black girls who would lure them to their beds as young as 10 in order to compromise them. That, that Jezebel stereotype led to a law on the books that put the age of consent at 10. And, and that's where this, this whole ball of wax gets rolled up together. The prejudice, the stereotypes, the politicians who want the votes and, and what they do with the power when they get the votes. Yes, sir. Some of those statues you were talking about were, were made with Vermont marble. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Not, not surprising. Good marble in Vermont, we know that. Uh, okay, I see one hand here and one hand there. Okay, let's, let's go here and then we'll go there. So, in your interactions with young people, students at Williams, what do uh, young African Americans see as their responsibility for ending the racism in terms of the bias from their community to the white community? I think, it's a, I think it's a question that, that they have not talked to me in class about. Uh, I, I, have some, I have some students who come to my office to talk about things. I tell a lot of these stories in my Southern history classes because I want them to understand that, that what, what racism is, is something that I absorb. And, and so I use my stories as teaching tools. And they will come by and talk to me. They're generally much more interested in finding out more about my, my parts of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to want add, uh, maybe it was clear from what you had said about the statues, but a lot of them, I mean hundreds, I, mean, I don't know if it went into the thousands, but they were actually made from molds. And mm -hmm. I had heard, and this part, I'm, I'm almost certain this is true that I had read, was that they just slightly changed the statues for the North and the South. They were basically the same mold that they'd have, you know, the Confederate <laughs> insignia or whatever. And, uh -huh. um, but they have no artistic value. And I think that's something that sometimes concerns people. Like, well, this is important, as, you know. And you may have noticed that when some of them are pulled down, you think, how could that be pulled down so easily? Yeah. They're not, you know, well-made or something. Yeah. But um, on the positive side, there's an incredible, um, it's a, I think it might be called a, a frieze. It's a flat uh, sculpture by St. Gaudens over at St. Gaudens National Park in New Hampshire, just over the river from here. That's of, um, it, I think it was General Shaw or um, yeah. Captain Shaw. Colonel, Colonel Shaw in the 54th Massachusetts. Yeah, and it, it is, 
and to hear Henry Duffy, who's one of the curators there, uh, and an historian talk about that, and to see it, it yeah, it's, it's one of the most moving uh, sculptures I've ever seen. It's before, it's, it's uh, in Boston, at the State House in Boston, yeah. I think, I think Margaret has her hand. Are we getting toward the end of the hour? Just that, um, uh, at least in Virginia, there are some pretty handsome um, uh, Johnny Rep statues all over the place because there was an article in the uh, New York Times Magazine that actually a man went and took a picture of every single one of them. And uh, I was quite moved at some of the, of the beauty of some of these um, portrait statues. But I don't think aesthetics is what is really what's an issue. It's what it, it's what it means, why that statue is there. Um, when people react to those statues, it's not whether it was a good representation, but uh, what it means to have a statue in a public place that commemorates um, a soldier who fought to keep people slaves. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We've come to the 4.30 hour. Thank you. Um, I know that the Yankee Bookshop has copies both of my book and, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.